she just loved to bring out, to, to notice what was happening in people's brilliant minds. She was the Napoleon. <laughs> she brought the goodness out into people. That dream of hers still continues to, to be implemented and it'll go on for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And that is the single, solitary, most important objective is that no one be denied an education that will benefit them. That is the beginning and the end of Native American studies as I perceive it as an educational tool to speak to the charge of this college to serve different people better. Mary Ellen Hilaire taught in the Native American Studies program at Evergreen State College from the school's opening in 1971 until her death in 1982. During those 11 years, she was a tireless advocate for Indian students within the college. Mary saw Evergreen's special mandate and flexibility as an opportunity to create a unique higher education program for the state's Native American population. She wanted a parallel school within Evergreen based on Native American values and traditions and designed for Native American students. There were 14 of us, you know, seven brothers and seven sisters. And Mary was about, let me see, the fifth from the youngest. Mary was born on February 7, 1927, the daughter of Joseph and Edna Hilaire, both members of the Lummi tribe. The family lived on the Lummi reservation in a modest wood house overlooking the Pacific Bay. Joseph Hilaire was a renowned orator and carver whose totem poles and canoes won international acclaim. Mary had a great deal of respect for her father and would often refer to his teachings later with her own students. He was one of the first tribal government, or they call him council, councilmen. He was, uh, he held the secretary's position in the first uh, Lummi Indian Business Council. And uh, they began the organization of the Lummi tribe through the Indian Reorganization Act. And um, he played a major uh, role in creating the census, creating the constitution, creating all of the documents necessary for that first tribal government. From an early age, Mary put a high value on education. Determined and extremely bright, she went to Western Washington University and then on to graduate school at the University of British Columbia. Mary was the first Lummi to get a master's degree in 1952. Well, for, for up to that date, uh, she was the first uh, to Lummi to get a master's degree. And <clears throat> that was in early childhood development. And she was also the first woman uh, <clears throat> or Indian to work with uh, the Department of Social and Health Services. And uh, she was the uh, first uh, Indian and first woman hired at the uh, 
Evergreen State College. And uh, in total, she was with the state 31 years. Well, it was difficult after her bachelor's degree to um, get into a position as a social worker, which she uh, really um, wanted to do. And additionally, it was difficult for her getting any position. So she was advised to get her bachelor's in social work from the University of British Columbia. Um, and um, had some major hurdles even then in breaking into the Department of Social and Health Services in Bellingham. Uh, when, she, when she was um, lucky enough to obtain a, a position with DSHS, um, her first uh, responsibilities were to remove children from her own relatives' homes and place them in white foster homes. So, putting her in a very, very difficult community, a position with the community, and um, making it additionally difficult for her as a professional. In a white-dominated society, Mary's success as a social worker came at a price. Her vision of helping and protecting children was compromised by the insensitivity of the institution for which she worked. In 1969, Mary decided to change careers and accepted a faculty position at the brand new college in Olympia. Um, this was not Brand X, this was an institution she could actually shape to her purposes. Uh, wasn't an institution bound with lots of rules and regulations and um, prohibitions, but an institution that could be nimble, could um, be innovative. The possibilities for real change at this alternative institution were immediately apparent to Mary. And when she said alternative, she meant alternative in a very different way than those of us who were thinking about it otherwise thought of it. We, she really um, saw it as a place where Native American students could shape an education that was out of their own tradition, that was, as she called it, a parallel system, not grounded in sort of Western intellectual history and philosophy, but grounded in Native American um, history and philosophy, and that Native American elders should be the source of authority for that, not Plato and the Greeks. In my mind, the main problem in higher education is the absence of the ultimate authority for excellence. And as an educator, I feel the people who are not only the generators of the values of Native American people, but who establish the main direction and intention of our culture are the elders. And of course, for the past 200 years, grievously so, the elders have been not only absent, but rejected from this position. Mary was one of the first faculty, actually, who reached out to communities and argued that the college had to go to those communities uh, to reach the people. And I think she, she made this uh, argument based on a, a deep felt feeling that moving people from their communities destroyed the roots that both supported them and supported those communities. So she was concerned about, I guess you could call it the brain drain that was happening in many Indian communities where um, people were sent off to colleges and universities off the reservation never to return again. And she thought that it was important to the community's survival um, that people be nurtured in those communities and stay in those communities to enhance them. And so going to them was uh, one way of making that happen. Um, she also felt, I think, that there was richness in those communities and wisdom in those communities that the college could learn from by going out um, to them.
was uh, very much into uh, getting in some mode of transportation and going out and talking to people, meeting with them, uh, saying, this is, this is what is available for you. This is uh, what uh, we can do, a place that you can come and, and uh, be uh, awarded for, rewarded for the knowledge that you gain, the, who you are. She was able to go to foundations and to get pledges from philanthropic organizations of money that would sponsor scholarships for Indian students. And then once awarded that amount of money, would go into Indian communities with catalogs and admissions forms in her trunk and pull those out and talk to people about uh, coming to Evergreen, fill out the registration forms right there and get students enrolled, students that couldn't afford, couldn't have come uh, in um, if it were any other way, and, um, and actually obtain their education. Mm. Well, Mary had a particularly um, well thought out, I think, sense of where schools went wrong in her own perspective, and in particular uh, in terms of Native American students. Um, her sense was that what most of schooling seemed to boil down to was uh, attendance, as she called it, attendance, attention, and assignments. You had to be there, you had to pay attention, and you had to do the assignments that the teachers set out for you. And she believed that this really wasn't uh, foundational in any way to developing uh, uh, an educational system that worked for people. She believed that in particular Native American students needed to um, get a, a very strong sense of their commitments. They needed to know what they were committed to. Um, they needed to have strong convictions about themselves in the world, their relationship to community, and so forth. And they had to have genuine concerns, things that would motivate them to um, take action and, uh, and be their very best. And she felt that it was quite um, sort of premature to, to take students who uh, didn't have a well thought out idea of who they were, what their interests were, what their capabilities were, and suggested them that they go through these particular academic programs, which may or may not have been useful to them at the time or until they were able to discover what their commitments were and so forth. So she felt that really that whole traditional emphasis of schooling was not one that in fact encouraged you know, an educated person. Mary taught that the four foundations of learning for Native students were music, talk, dance, and art. These were the disciplines that each student must be versed in to have a complete education. She brought weavers, storytellers, and dancers into the classrooms. The mm -hmm. Beautiful four example. disciplines that we have talked about have been completely drawn <coughs> like like <coughs> two threads through all your your talk. The first one is Indian music, which in the literary sense is the Indian stories, because a lot of them are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Then Indian dance, that is the art form of Indian people, and then what we call talk, which engulfs and involves everything that has communicative qualities. And then the last is art, which I feel has been performed from the symbolizing of ideas, ideas that have come from ideal relationships. And it's astounding how compact these have been as they are defined in the values and the culture and the attitudinal history of Indian people and they've been sustained they've pulled right through didn't matter if you had a PhD or a master's degree she knew there were elders there was wisdom in the community and she sought that out and thought it should be recognized and validated and passed on and I, I think she felt it was um, a different kind of wisdom that was missing in too many colleges and universities, a kind of wisdom that fed the soul, fed the heart, and um, maintained generations of commitment. Dedicated to the care and the service 
of Native American people of this state designed to allow them to maintain the cultural heritage, the beautiful character of past communities, and reestablish within the federal and state governments a relationship that will redefine the sovereignty that lives in our hearts, the culture that we did not surrender, and the future for our young people aspiring to be all that is in them to become. She was the Napoleon. <laughs> She was that leader. She took command of the time in the classroom, and we ended up with so much up here and not enough time to have lunch. And I can still see Mary holding forth and describing her vision, and she had a amazing gift for turning words into paintings. I mean, she would um, give um, almost religious speeches to the students um, that were very nonlinear in some ways. And they took meandering paths here and there. And sometimes you wondered where she was going. And yet at the end, you had this amazing multidimensional picture with a powerful kind of point at the end. She delivered her message in a, a very straightforward way and continuous, and she would talk for hours, hours. And so we'd come in like at 9 or so in the morning and sit down, and sometimes class didn't let up even for a lunch break until 1 or 2 in the afternoon. And she just held us, me anyway, I was spellbound. It was, it was wonderful. It is through our hope in the direction that this institution and institutions like it can manage the change that will allow such hospitality, that will be dedicated to such hope as to maintain the steady voice of Indian culture in this land. Again, this land that's our land. Shortly after I joined the program, she would establish Monday as a day when anyone from anywhere could come and there would be large group conversations about things or people would come in, invited guests, the elders and so forth. Um, the rest of the days, what she emphasized to me was that it was very important to simply be there. That instead of requiring each individual Native American person who was involved in many things in their own communities to come in at a certain hour, that we needed to be as available as possible, as much as possible, when we were in, the bill, or in town. So um, for the first, I taught with her for five years, and I would say that we sat in our offices many, many, many hours, and people would come. They would come on Tuesday at 3. One Saturday morning, I was sitting there, and a man came over from Montana. He had driven over and was expecting that we would be there, and we were. Now, I think that that's about what hospitality is. It's, it's meeting somebody exactly where they are, not trying to get them to be who they're not, and to, to um, help them find the resources that, that lets them be an artist or a historian or a, a politician or you know, who, whoever they are, that they've come to this earth to, to be, have their life here. She really thought long term. She had actually a 20 year plan. She laid down what she thought the 20 year themes should be here. Um, it wasn't good enough for her to reinvent the curriculum every year without remaining committed to serving Native students, and so she laid it down, and we're still operating under those themes. Instead of assigning papers, Mary was more likely to ask her students to design their own curriculum that could reconnect them to their community or tribe. Even with a non-traditional school, Mary's methods were controversial. At one point, it seemed like Mary might even be fired. 
To appease the administration, other faculty stepped in to do some of the paperwork that Mary avoided. In this way, Mary was able to continue her work with her students. I can remember one time a kind of difficult meeting that we had, and she said at the end, this is all part of learning to communicate. Um, and 10 years from now, this, this won't matter, um, except that we've continued to talk and work. And she did. In the late 70s, Mary began to discuss the idea of a longhouse at Evergreen. She envisioned a Native American center where all people would be welcome to come, talk, eat, celebrate, and learn. Her hope was that people from different backgrounds could come together and establish what she called a footing of mutual understanding. And one day we hope that within the intrinsic building composition of this institution, we will build a home for Native American people. In this hope, we kind of design this place as though one might, closing their eyes, see the character the nature and the symbol of our way of living together. Some call it a longhouse, some call it a roundhouse, some call it a smokehouse, which is dear to my way of thinking, because that's what we called our homes. But whatever it was called, it defined the practical responsibility of hospitality. She wanted there to be um, not an erection of a place like the Smithsonian Institution where you picked apart bones and displayed uh, pieces of history in showcases. It wasn't so much a place that you would come to study Native Americans. It was a place where Native Americans could come to study. In 1980, just 10 years into the experiment of the new college, Mary was diagnosed with breast cancer. With her usual resilience, she refused to give in and maintain her demanding teaching schedule. Actually, no. She didn't slow down and as, as long as I knew her. Um, she, after she was sort of unable to get around easily on her own, she had her favorite vehicle, which was her Amigo, her little cart. And she would zoom around the library in her Amigo um, and um, was as uh, completely present as um, she had ever been. She tried to fulfill all the promises that she made to her prior students two weeks prior to death. She, di she didn't give up. She rested a lot. She went back to classes and acted like there was nothing wrong until she couldn't tolerate it anymore. When um, I went off and went working in other places and then I got a phone call from her when she was um, getting, she was pretty sick and was, had cancer and said she didn't have much longer to be here and she came out to my house and sat with me and, and looked right at me and said, if you don't build this, it's not going to get done and you have to build this. It was like, your assignment is not over. This, we talk about lifelong learning, and, and um, I didn't know when I signed up for her 
her Native American Studies program that, that I was in it for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I am. Mary lost her struggle with cancer on October 2nd, 1982. In her last hours, she was with friends and family who took turns sitting with her as others sang Lummy songs. When Mary Ellen died, I believe that not just myself, but everyone missed her courage, her wit, her intelligence, that wisdom that only she had. And uh, what she brought to both uh, our world and yours. After Mary's death, some of her students redoubled their efforts to get the longhouse built. Thirteen years later, the building was finally completed. Today it stands as a testament to Mary's legacy at Evergreen and to the vision she inspired in others. And then when we had the, the grand opening, it was unbelievable just unbelievable the power and the, the spirit that was filling this house and not just Mary but but everybody you know all the ancestors were here and, and celebrating and and people were just enthralled with it the music was booming through the place and the, the floor had been cleaned and the ceremonies had been done and it had been done caringly and and just right and I totally felt the, her presence here and felt like, well, now, you know, let's have an evaluation. <laughs> her life, uh, I think, uh, never ends. I, I think it's, uh, her, her dream certainly will never end. Her life, her, her you know, she, we mention her name every time we, we meet in the Longhouse. Uh, this is the first state college that, that, that ever uh, uh, built a Longhouse on their college, and that's a recognition of our Indian people. That's a great, great event that took place here in Evergreen College. Uh, this college is very unique. Uh, uh, Mary knew that and, uh, and tried to uh, set it in a, the institution in a way to to uh, uh, involve Indian tribes and Indian people. Today we have satellites out on reservations. We're educating our, our people out there. None of this could be done if we all weren't working together and uh, recognized each other and uh, respected one another. It's very important that uh, we, keep, uh, we keep talking like this and we keep making educational tools like this, this, this uh, that's being made right now to talk about one of our great ladies, and that was Mary Hilaire. She left a great legacy. She taught so many people to bring out their best. Her wisdom, you know, reached into your heart and your soul and lifted up everyone's spirits. And I'd like to add, you know, that what I miss the most included also our talks, even our arguments. We agreed to disagree, and no one does that anymore. Hiring Mary Hilaire, I think, was one of the turning points for the college. Um, and it was a, a big statement about both 
community activism and reaching out to Indian communities and working with the knowledge in those communities out of a new paradigm of respect and um, Indian leadership. And so that one hire, uh, 25 years later, has led to the Longhouse, to having 10 additional Native American faculty. It's now led to working with six tribal communities on the reservations as Mary um, thought it should be done. I was told about Mary Hilaire through a friend of mine. She encouraged me to come here and she said you feel very good about yourself to continue with your education. And I would have to agree with her this has been the case. Today, survival <clears throat> is education. And education is a tool. Another word that I have learned as a result of having worked with Mary is the concept of hospitality. My recommendation for Evergreen, may there always be a Mary Hilaire here. And I feel that most education, if it's going to be functional, is community composition. How people learn to live with each other. Establishing the kind of value system, designing the relationships or the uh, uh, culture, and establishing a freedom of attitude that will allow people again to address the three concepts, identity, group loyalty, individual authority. Oh, oh.